uh, it's my great pleasure to present to you Dr. Candace Pert, who wrote this wonderful book called Molecules of Emotion, and just got to meet her at 5 o'clock. She's an absolute doll, a brilliant woman bucking the system. I love her already. Uh, we've been endeavoring, and God bless Diane, has been, she kind of never heard of Ramtha. So you can imagine she's endeavoring. She saw the magical brain tape and Ramtha revisited. That was it. And so Diane has been filling her in on how much we know and kind of what we do so that she gets a sense of us. And I told her she's going to love you to get all of that wonderful energy back. But anyway, she's a brilliant woman born uh, with a divine power working through her that I think she's finally has, has some way recognized. And um, let's focus that her research goes on and she gets the funding that's necessary to make all this possible. It's my honor to present to you Candace Perk. just, as I walked in, I honestly was, I could feel the energy in this room. I was like, Whoo! and uh, it was wonderful. <laughs> it was quite a whiff. I was, uh, I heard about your field exercise, and I would very much love to see the people who found their pattern, if they would stand up for me. I would really like to look at them. I'm starting to get that nothing's impossible. <laughs> I kind of had a suspicion. Uh, I mean, just being here, it sort of seemed impossible, but it was the strangest thing, the way my schedule just happened <laughs> to have an opening exactly. And uh, well, if it wasn't, that wasn't enough. And then um, the, as I go up to catch the Washington Post in the morning and go to the edge of the driveway, like I do every morning, you know, I gotta keep up with all the exciting news from Washington. Uh, at that moment, the driver w came and exactly met me and handed me the tickets for this trip. I mean, it was strange. Who's this guy coming up in my driveway at 6.30 a.m.? I was like, oh, oh you know. <laughs> Oh, so I don't knock it over when I flail around? Mm. <laughs> It'll be right here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Mm. So I'm going to um, speak from my heart, tell you what I know. I'm a scientist. I will speak from being a scientist, uh, tell what I know as science, talk from my experience, speak of. Uh, what I know as a woman, person, human being, and I'll um, um, t label things that are ideas, and I'm very, you know, I'll talk for about 45 minutes for an hour and show slides. That's my format. That's what I'm kind of used to doing. And then we can have a question and answer period where I fully expect to learn more than what I teach, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> May I have the first slide, please? Anyway, slide number one, I'll describe it to you. It's actually a joke. Uh, there's a gravestone on it, and it says, Joe Blow, 19 whatever to 19. See, it wasn't psychosomatic. <laughs> and because our culture uh, really believes that uh, psychosomatic means unreal, uh, imaginary illness, and uh, I've really come from my research. This is a journey that I've been on for uh, this 20, 25 years. In fact, it'll be exactly 25 years this March, 
just a few weeks that my first paper, pivotal paper, the discovery of the opiate receptor was published. It'll be the exact 25th year anniversary. And what I've come to realize is that all illness, all illness has a psychosomatic, a mind-body component. I've come really very gradually to that. There's really no illness that's not a mental illness. And there's no physical illness that doesn't have a mental a component. And there's no mental illness that doesn't have a physical component. And the two are just very intertwined. But we're living in a culture where the medical uh, paradigm is really not uh, recognizing this. I don't want to say things that are too obvious. This is a very advanced group. I'm used to talking to uh, medical school professors, so. <laughs> 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 Takes a while, but sometimes they don't even laugh. Okay, well, I, <laughs> well, I want to teach you a little bit about receptors. That's my, uh, my, my PhD from Johns Hopkins is in pharmacology, so technically I'm a pharmacologist, but I think I'm really a receptorologist because <laughs> that is kind of where my career has been focused and it just keeps unfolding because receptors, uh, we can think of them as little keyholes and they were first invoked as an idea to explain the fact that no drug acts unless it's fixed on a receptor, which was at one time just an imaginary idea. Uh, so every drug works because like a, like a a key combining in a lock, it's uh, fixing to, to the receptor. Um, it also came from endocrinology. And in endocrinology, there's this whole idea of hormones acting at a distance. They get secreted from one place, they move throughout the body, through the brain, uh, and all over, and at the end, they combine with receptors wherever they are. So it came from both of these fields. So here is a scientific diagram of a receptor. <laughs> and it's, it's sitting on the surface of a cell. And if this is the size of a receptor, then the cell would be maybe, depending on which cell, but it would be probably several times as big as, as this entire volume of this room. So you can picture that. And uh, each one cell might have hundreds of thousands of receptors on it. And these, these little keyholes are facing outward. And they're really arranged almost in a mosaic pattern. The membrane of a cell is very, um, it's, it's kind of like a, an oil slick. And the receptors really kind of float on the oil slick. But uh, as I, there's a nice analogy in the book, they're kind of like lily pads. Uh, they have roots that can go down into the cell. Uh, and you all have an idea of what a cell is. You know, your body's composed of trillions of cells. You know all this. So it's facing outward. And this, my, the all-purpose word is ligand, L-I-G-A-N-D. It, it means um, kind of that which binds. And it can be a drug that's an exogenous ligand coming in from the outside or it can be uh, an internal ligand, such as a peptide that we'll talk about. Um, and they're sort of like the keys that bind. Now, when the receptor, or the receptors, because remember, I'm just showing you one. There's hundreds of thousands bigger than the room, and we're only looking at one cell, and there's trillions of cells in the body. And when the receptor receives the ligand, things happen. Uh, the receptor literally moves. It's kind of moving and vibrating. And once the ligand kind of fits into it, uh, it kind of stays more in one position than another. And all kinds of things happen. Everything that a cell is doing at any given moment is a function of what receptors have ligands on it, which ligands, how many, which ones don't. And sort of, it's sort of like tickling the outer surface of the cell. And everything, whether the cell decides to divide or not to divide, whether the, the cell decides to shift from making this particular chemical 
or that particular chemical, all of that is totally regulated by what comes on from the outside. And you should know that this is total, there is no, up, everything that I've said up to now, except that crack about the uh, professors, of course, <laughs> everybody would uh, totally agree with. I think all scientists would absolutely agree with that. Very, very solid. There's literally hundreds of papers supporting how important these receptors are. And the breakthrough was that they were just ideas. And then about 25 years ago, the first drug receptor was demonstrated. And it was the opiate receptor. And I was this young graduate student believing it was possible. There was, you know, there was a lot of reasons why it was impossible, everybody told me. And I had this sort of romantic attachment to um, making it happen. And it was very hard. And it was just a matter of finding the right recipe. Okay, that's what a lot of, uh, 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 the right ingredients, the right ratios to make, you know, the right time, the right temperature, you know, it's sort of like, how do you bake a lemon meringue pie? Well, if you've never had one or seen one, you might try it a lot of different ways before you get it right. Anyway, so there's a receptor, there's a ligand, uh, you know about a cell. Okay, well, this is just experience the delights of opium. I should have had that on. Uh, this is, you know, I was really entranced by find the, the challenge to find the opiate receptor. This was my project. So at the time, which was 1972, uh, the, the chemists, uh, the pharmacologists believed that there were opiate receptors, that is, places where drugs like heroin, morphine, opium, methadone, uh, actually Demerol, and even cough medicine, you know, dextromethorphan, all bound at two these hypothetical opiate receptors. And then worked out a method to, to find it. And I won't get into uh, the technical details, except to say um, it's basically done by making a radioactive form of opiate, making it bind, and uh, kind of counting with a Geiger counter how much is, is stuck to it. But that's a little dull. Let me not lose you. Well, this, these are actual maps, years, jumping years later. I, I worked for many years at the National Institutes of, of Health, which is in Bethesda, where um, diseases are studied. And um, at the NIH, uh, we developed a method for actually seeing. So what you're looking here is, a, is one example of thousands of slides I could bore you with. This one's dull enough, but uh, they'll get prettier. You just sort of take a rat brain and you're looking, you're moving through it. This is the extreme. These are the olfactory bulbs. This is kind of the f more the front of the brain. Rats don't have much of a frontal cortex. You know, they're sort of dumb compared to us. Uh, and then you're moving backwards. And here you're kind of winding up in the midbrain. And, and these are the maps of opiate receptors where it's dark. There's a lot of opiate receptors. And these are very complicated, and I don't want to over simplify. Uh, I mean, there are, the way science works, there might be one guy who's the world's expert, and all he or she knows is this little part of that little part of the brain. And they know all the connections, and they can look at this map and say, my gosh, it looks like the opiate receptors are over this particular nucleus. A nucleus is just a group of brain cells. Uh, so this just gives you an idea of what opiate receptors look like. But the biggie, okay, the receptor was great, moving along, publishing papers on it. It was sort of astounding. But, you know, it started, the question started coming, you know, why did God put opiate receptors in the brains of animals? You know, so that people could get high? I mean, that, you know, didn't really make a lot of sense. And then people started saying, well, there must be a natural internal ligand that binds to those receptors. And sure enough, uh, in 1976, two Scottish scientists uh, found uh, what's called the endorphins, the endogenous morphines. And um, there was a whole, this is, this, it could be a whole story in itself. And in the book, I'm trying to do the focus thing a little better. Maybe you can do it from the back. In the book, um, I talk a lot about the race. A lot of science is um, you know, racing, competition. Scientists work for 
ego a lot. They don't get paid a lot of money. They like to see their name in print. That's the ultimate thrill. And you get your name in print if you publish papers and share information with others. Uh, so there was a big race for the brain zone morphine. And the key discovery was that it turned out to be a peptide. That's what touched off everything. Now, what is a peptide? It's really simple. It's a chemical class. And peptides are strings of amino, amino acids. And you've heard of amino acids. Peptides are, they're also tiny little proteins. You've heard about proteins. And both, both peptides and proteins are strings of amino acids. And, uh, you know, uh, proteins can have uh, several hundred amino acids in a row. Peptides that are really important in the body can have three, four, five. Uh, not all peptides are made by the body. Peptides are made um, by uh, companies that are put in our food. NutraSweet, aspartame, that's, that's a dipeptide, meaning it's got two amino acids. That, that, that's actually a dipeptide that fits into your sweetness receptor in your tongue. So it feels sweet to you, even though uh, it's not really sugar and you can't use the calories of it, etc. So there's 20 amino acids about, and just like you could imagine the first 20 letters of the alphabet. And so they're strung together, just like, um, you know, I use, I use my, imagine popette beads. Is anybody old enough to remember popette beads? Didn't we love them? Yeah, I, I, I'd like to find them again. They're colored beads and you can stick them together. One part fits into the other. The part that fits is called the peptide bond. That's actually where that term came from. Peptide refers to the peptide bond. So there's 20 amino acids. Uh, different ones strung, and you can imagine an infinite, just like you can imagine a, an infinite number of words that you could put together or nonsense sequences. I mean, there's really infinite. If you've got 20 possibilities, you can make dipeptides, tripeptides, pentapeptides. Well, your body doesn't make infinite. It makes a very finite number of important peptides. What that finite number is, we haven't quite figured it out yet. It's certainly more than 150, and if I were going to guess, based upon what we know, it's, it'll be less than 500. It's not infinite. But with machines, this was one of the great things that the brains on morphine turned out to be a peptide. If it had turned out to be other chemical classes, it would have been really hard to make progress. But peptides, there's machines that make peptides. It's done automatically. Overnight, you can uh, make virtually any short peptide that you can think of. You can just program it in, and there's this machine that does the chemical uh, reaction. So these are actually the structures. We're not going to, it's really not important at all. But you know, names of amino acids, like there's two kinds of enkephalin. That was the original name for the brain zone morphine. Uh, tyrosine, glycine, glycine, phenylalanine, leucine. And, and uh, that's one sequence. And then there's beta endorphin, which comes out of your pituitary gland. And that's actually 31 amino acids long. And the first five are the enkephalin sequence. And it's really, you know, scientists, there's a saying that scientists would rather use each other's toothbrushes than each other's terminology. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's really, it's a whole ego trip. We don't, ha you know, we don't have a lot of fame and glory. We're within our own little clique, our own little tribe. But you know, you get something named, you know, you name it and you feel good about it. So the, the Scottish group called it enkephalin, which means from the head, which they actually isolated originally from pig brains. And then the American scientists, they had to, like they do, they like to one-up the Europeans. And uh, they called it endorphins, which means endogenous morphines. And that's kind of a better word. And that word actually is the one that's stuck. And you know, today, you can read in any magazine, you know, endorphins, orgasm, runner's high, bonding, infant mother bonding, all these things. There's data that shows what, what it does. And people invoke it, hey, my endorphins. There was a whole movie, Liquid Sky. I don't know if anybody saw that uh, a while ago. But back in 1976, when this was discovered, it was astounding to people. 
and it, it's amazing how quickly it entered and people, you know, it entered the popular culture, and it was very exciting to be a part of that for me. So here are three rats that have been injected with the, br different, the brains on morphine, morphine, and this is actually a peptide uh, version of, of, of enkephalin that lasts a long time. You can see them, they're utterly blissed out. <laughs> it's called, this, I call this slide, Rats in Bliss. And look at them. Well, they, they look like they've just had a fabulous massage or, you know, they look like this. Their head is thrown back, just like opium. And of course, there's lots of experiments showing what they do and many, many forms that have been discovered. There's a form of endorphins in milk and in mother's milk. It's actually a form with a recent, slightly different chemical structure. So here's the word neurojuices, a highly technical word that I coined because I was, uh, I was uh, reacting to the, all the fights about should we call these new substances neuromodulators or we, should we call them neurotransmitters? And what happened was once the endorphins were discovered, everybody went, it was peptide mania, the peptide generation. I mean, people were, any peptide that had ever been discovered anywhere in biology in any context, people were looking to see if it was in the brain. And my lab at the National Institutes of Health was looking to see if we could find receptors for peptides in the brain. We called them neuropeptides. And we were never disappointed. If you got it technically right, anything you looked for uh, was there. And you really got the, 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 the idea of the importance of these peptides. There's just so many of them. Now, before that, there was just a few substances called neurotransmitters. And you probably know some of these. Acetylcholine is probably the first one that was discovered. Norepinephrine is another one. Serotonin, you've heard a lot about serotonin since there's a Prozac deficiency in this culture. And uh, they, they might pass a law in Washington to put Prozac in the water supply. But there's some talks going on with Eli Lilly right now. Uh, no, that's a joke, of course. <laughs> But uh, so serotonin, these are classical. And the classical neurotransmitters, although they are not peptides, there are other types of chemicals. They're slightly smaller. They're, they're one amino acid that has a few little atoms rearranged in a different way. Uh, but conceptually, they're very much like peptides since they all um, are secreted from the brain, and as you'll see other places, and they all work by attaching to receptors. Um, so it's conceptually, it's a lock and key kind of a situation, although, and this is what's very interesting, uh, lock and key is really old think. It's kind of an old paradigm, and all I could draw was the lock and the key in my, in my cartoon. You can visualize it better if you close your eyes, and I know this group is very good about <laughs> closing their eyes and visualizing things. And try that and realize that the receptor molecule itself, which is kind of a long string of amino acids, so long, it's like a beaded necklace. It's almost like folded in on itself, sort of floating there. It's really vibrating, moving. It's very dynamic. And there, you know, we don't really understand. I suspect that they're vibrating in some kind of synchronous rhythm. The vibration is real. There's biophysicists who study it. Uh, people don't really understand deeply what's going on, but if you know about quantum mechanics, you know that the receptor, uh, like other things, it, it doesn't have an infinite number of vibrational possibilities. It, it'll favor some positions more than other. And obviously that vibration, work is being done. You know, maybe as the receptors are vibrating on one cell, different things are being pumped in and out of the cell. And then when the ligands bind to the receptor, they kind of stabilize and keep it, lock it into one position. It's all about how much time it's spending in, 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 in position. So you can sort of visualize that. Can people sort of see that in their, in their mind's eye? And whatever you see is true, because nobody can draw a diagram of it. In fact, it would even be hard to do a cartoon of it, because our understanding is so imperfect at this time. 
So this is actual data, this beautiful rainbow picture. And this is a, a slice through the brain of a, a monkey, actually. And the colors, uh, we used to call it the rainbow machine. I have an obsession with rainbows. You know, the cover of my book has this gorgeous rainbow on it. <laughs> um, the rainbow uh, computer, you've seen this. This is basically the weather map thing, where red means there's a lot of receptors. Blue means there's not that many receptors. So, you know, we went from the black and white to the color, then you can instantly see where most of the receptors are. So what you see here is that this is actually the pituitary gland, the hypothalamus, and this is the amygdala, uh, or the amygdaloid nucleus. There's another one on the other side. It's sort of kind of cut off. And what we discovered very early was that these parts of the parts of the brain that classically the scientists had said this, these are the parts of the brain where emotions are controlled or mediated, they were loaded in opiate receptors. Now this concept of the limbic system has to be looked at. It's thrown around a lot. Scientists kind of argue about it. Some people say it's just a metaphor. Uh, there's kind of, we're not really, you know, there's some, some disagreement about it. But the reason that the amygdala got to be part of the limbic system or got to be the idea that emotions were mediated there was the fact that these neurophysiologists up in Montreal were working on um, awake people who, were, who had a lot of epileptic seizures and they were stimulating the brain. And what they found was that when they stimulated the part of the cortex that was over the amygdala, or near the amygdala, the people would have a whole emotional gamut. They would cry or they would laugh. They would have often memories associated with it and they would just show extreme emotion. So that's how we got to, to think that the emotions are stored or mediated by this part of the brain. But my theme is going to be that uh, the paradigm that the brain is where emotions are is really breaking down. I, I think what I'm thinking about is that the emotions are really kind of a bridge between the mind and the body, and they are as much in the body as they are in the brain. In fact, they really play a role in manifesting or actually creating the matter of the body. And that is, it's more than a metaphor. It's, I want to develop that. It's based on hard, hard facts. Well, the first mind-blowing or paradigm-shifting thing that happened was when we discovered that insulin, I mean, insulin, what's insulin? Where is insulin? Everybody point to where insulin? In your pancreas, right? Is there insulin in your brain? You bet, there's insulin in your brain. Who told you, did Ramtha tell you that? <laughs> Honest to God? <laughs> when? Well, then you guys, you're several steps ahead of the endocrinologist. <laughs> they've still, uh, they, when, think, when new information doesn't fit, scientists tend to disregard it, forget it, disbelieve it. And the papers on this were really published almost uh, 10 years ago, that there's insulin in the brain and insulin receptors in the brain. Guess where? This is a rat, the amygdala and the hypothalamus again in these limbic system or emotional areas but the people don't, the endocrinologists don't know quite what to do with it because they're over here, they're the endocrinologists and the neuroscientists, they're over there. And maybe they're competing for the same money and they don't, you know, unless there's an endocrinologist married to an immunologist, or a, <laughs> they don't talk much. So th this is actually a theme. There's a lot of, you know, uh, separation of the various disciplines, but that's not how the body works at all. The body-mind is really one unit, and uh, it's just much, much more integrated. So it's not just that conceptually hormones are very much like neurotransmitters and neuropeptides. It's like they're the same things. I mean, they're, they're all one thing. It's just an accident that somebody discovered insulin and said, let's have an endocrinology department and you can be the boss and we can have awards and we can keep other, you know, it's just an accident of, of history. 
And in real life, they're really all the same thing. But uh, there's very little studies on what insulin actually does in the brain, but it suggests that even diseases like diabetes, maybe, you know, there's, there's a capacity there. So I wanted to mention that Charles Darwin, who was a pretty respectable guy, uh, you know, he actually wrote a book called Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals, several years after he um, wrote Origin of the Species and talked about evolution. People, very few people know about this book. Uh, it was actually out of print for many, many years and almost in, in all countries except one. Who can guess what country that was? Where it's, well, Italy. <laughs> Stayed in print in Italy. Uh, that says something about, but what Charles Darwin said was that emotions are so important for the survival of the species that they must have, uh, they must be in the simplest creatures. And he said, one day when we discover the physiology, the physiological basis of the emotions, we're going to find that it's the same down to the simplest creature. And he said physiological. He didn't say biochemical. Why didn't he say biochemical? Because biochemistry hadn't been invented and wouldn't be invented for another 30 years. So he said physiological. And you know, em evolution is really it's sort of a pessimistic subject because for an animal to survive, it has to always worry. It has to come from, from lack. It has to come from concern. It has to come from, I'm going to die. I'm going to run out. And um, you know, we talk about reptilian brains and the basic lower brains. And people have argued with that. Paul McLean, who's a friend of mine, developed that idea. But we do have layers of brain, and we have parts of lower brain that can run us, I think, and keep us uh, worrying about what's going to happen, happen next, uh, even, even though you know, you're comfortable and you're fine. That's just really in there. That's programmed in, because it's been in there for, for millions of years. So this is sort of a, a technical looking map, but what I wanted, to, I wanted to show you, I want to make a point. I'm going to take a sip of water. Great, great water out here. <laughs> um, so my colleagues, Birgit Zipser and Joanna Hill, that worked with me for many years, uh, at some point while we were at the NIH, peptide receptors for about 20, 25 different ones had been mapped in the brain. And they made sort of a master map. And what they showed is that the amygdala and actually the hippocampus which is here, which actually stands for, um, it's actually Latin for, for, for a seahorse, because it kind of looks like a seahorse. This is sort of part, this is a part near the, near the hippocampus, that over 90% of the receptors could be found there. So this is the emotional part of the brain. And then you can see like a lot of receptors are, this is putting it all together. This is compressing a real lot of complicated information into an oversimplification. But I just thought it would be interesting to put it out here, because you have some teachings. There's a lot of uh, new ideas. There's a lot of uninterpretable facts in here. You know, there's just data. There's a lot of data on where these uh, substances are without understanding what it means. But you can see a lot in the cortex, a lot in the limbic system. Not so many receptors in the midbrain or, or the cerebellum, although, although there is some, ex some exceptions, and, and back uh, through the brain. But this, we got to talk about the spinal cord. And if I forget, because I know I forgot my slide on the spinal cord, well, I'll tell you right now, that's almost the other place. That is the other place where virtually all receptors can be found. What part of the spinal cord? You know, your spinal cord goes all the way down your back. and. The back, it's called the dorsal horn, the back part, is rich in virtually every kind of receptor. And that's where incoming sensory information must first, first enters the nervous system. What do we mean by incoming somatosensory? Sensations from your body, pain, pleasure, vibrations, hot, cold, any sensations that are coming from your body 
your face uh, are first entering there. And isn't that interesting that these receptors, which, you know, I'm calling them the molecules of emotion, and I'm basing that theory, it's a theory, it's a good theory. There's a ton of data to support it. I don't think anyone can disprove it. These are the molecules of emotion because A, they're in the parts of the brain that people classically say has to do with emotion. B, as Darwin predicted, they're in the simplest animals. There's an animal called a tetrahymena that's so simple, it's only one cell. And that cell makes endorphins, it makes insulin, it has on its surface opiate receptors and insulin receptors, and I bet you it has a lot of others but people haven't bothered to look because it's just too weird, <laughs> basically. Up there they are. There's the te two tetrahymena on a date. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, this is a very basic principle. What we're talking about here is the principle of communication. And just like there's four, I think you've learned that there's four uh, nucleotides that in DNA that code for all life, whether we're talking about a human being or a virus, these substances are communication molecules. And whether we're talking about one cell talking to another cell that are two separate animals, or whether we're talking about the spleen talking to your brain, it's, it's communication that's going on. One's, this one's squirting out a substance and it's binding to the surface of the other one. And that's, that's kind of what's going on, the communication. And this just is a dull biochemistry slide that shows that you can, you can make molecules move along in an in a electrical field and depending on their weights and characteristics, some will move faster than others. And what this slide shows is that whether you get opiate receptors from a rat brain or a tetrahymena or a leech, they're identical. It's the same building block. It's like, you know, a certain brick. It can be in the basement of your house. It can be in the attic. Uh, the same component from our brain. I mean, that's, that's evolution. And there's the leeches. They're really interesting. Ugh. They, uh, <laughs> what's interesting is that not only is it the same chemicals, um, but also the way it's organized is similar. So yeast actually squirt out at each other when they mate something called yeast mating factor. It's a peptide, and it's about 70% identical, meaning, I think it's, about, I forgot, I think it's about 25 amino acids long, but it's 70% of them are in exactly the same place and are exactly identical with something we make called gonadotrophin releasing hormone, which is a it comes up in puberty and it comes out of your pituitary gland and makes your sex organs develop. The two are almost identical. The yeast mating factor is like the human mating factor. Isn't that far out? I mean, that is, that talk about evolution. I understand there's some people who don't believe in it. That, and also, um, people were a little surprised. It started in the beginning. No, I was a neuroscientist. I went into neuroscience because I was interested in consciousness. And I figured consciousness is in the brain, right? The body just exists to carry the head around, right? And so I, that's, that's why I went into it and then found that um, it isn't that way at all. Big discovery, beta endorphin, your ovaries or testes have uh, more beta endorphin than uh, most parts of your brain. That, that are coming out. So these, these substances, they're in the brain, they're in the body, they're in glands, and in a moment you'll see what has real implications for healing and changing in your, in your body is that it's in the immune system. So this was, this was a long time ago. I was pregnant with my now 16-year-old, and I was at the NIH, and I was asked to give a lecture for the layman. Well, what's the point of all this? What does it do for people what practical meaning do these receptors have? That was way back then. And I just scratched in there and said, brain receptors for opiates and other psychoactive drugs are the keys to the biochemistry of emotion. That was uh, the idea, the keys. And this is another source of evidence. I mentioned 
that they're the molecules of the emotion, they're in the right place, they're in simple creatures, just as Darwin predicted they will be. And third, they, these subs, the external drugs cause us to have different mood states, different emotions with different behaviors, even different memories and different body postures. So that's the third, th it's a whole field called psychopharmacology where people study the drugs and, and what they do. There's another interesting thing about this slide that I think is really interesting and profound, particularly for people who are into different kinds of body work, which is, look at, you know, this guy's in love. He's got that red flush, right? This guy is grief-stricken and like all the blood is squeezed out of his face. He's white, very white. And you know, you can look, this guy's mad. He's got these little mad patches of red just in one, in one place. And it turns out that many of these peptides have receptors on walls of blood vessels. And they affect whether the blood vessel is open, dilated, a lot of blood going through, or whether the blood vessel is constricted and not much is going, they actually affect whether the blood, uh, whether the blood vessel is growing and expanding or shrinking. That's real important for cancer because this is a new area of excitement. If you can figure out what peptides are triggering, uh, are, are, are coming into the tumor and you can block them, well then the tumor is just going to shrink up because it has no blood supply. So uh, emotions have a lot to do with blood flow. And you just think about when you're looking at people's faces, you know, a lot of us can read faces pretty well. And you, a lot of times you're looking at the colorations and the blood flow. And what you're really seeing, you know, that's your whole front of your brain is behind that thing that we call our face. And what you're really seeing is patterns of where a lot of blood is, is flowing or not flowing. So the emotions, Look at that, the emotions are running where the blood is flowing. And that has a lot to do with healing, too, because if the blood is flowing well to a certain area, it's bringing nutrients, it's bring, and it's taking away waste products, and things can grow and move. And I had the privilege of knowing Norman Cousins, now dead, the late Norman Cousins, who, who, who said, you know, what do we need drugs for? The brain potentially has all the chemicals that it could ever need to heal ourselves. It's a pharmacopoeia. It's free. It has no side effects. Uh, of course, he was saying just the brain, because he hadn't yet, the research hadn't yet realized that they're also uh, throughout the body. So he actually told me a story of uh, his elbow. He was a, an avid tennis player, and he broke his, his elbow playing tennis. And he was really sad, and the doctor said, that's a bad place to get a break. It's going to take at least six months because the elbow heals very slowly. So Norman, who didn't believe doctors all that much, <laughs> necessarily. So why? Why does the elbow heal so slowly? Doctor said, well, because it has a really lousy blood supply. He told me this story. So he said, oh, well, if it has a lousy blood supply, well, that's easy. I'll just visualize a lot of blood flowing through it. So every day, this is, he just sort of invented this himself. He wasn't using any uh, practice. And he just sort of visualized with his eyes closed the blood flowing. And he claims he was back playing tennis in under three months and more like two months. And he swears that. And he had no reason to lie to it. But you know, it's a principle that's important. So be it. <laughs> 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 Sorry. <laughs> I watched one tape and it's very it's very contagious. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to show you, uh, this, these are marijuana receptors. It took a long time to do the marijuana receptor. This is from my friend Miles Herkenham at the NIH that I worked with a lot. And the bright, now we have different screens, the bright, uh, fiery places are the places where there's really a lot of marijuana receptors. The brain's own marijuana 
has recently been discovered. And it's not a peptide, it's in another chemical class. Um, and, um, you know, everybody has marijuana receptors. Everybody has this internal marijuana, even Nancy Reagan. <laughs> everybody. And, uh, you know, it's looking, it's sort of like looking at tea leaves. We don't really understand. We can describe what this means, but it, I mean, it's very complex. And this is just one level of the brain. This is a rat's brain cut sort of right down the middle. Uh, it's called a sagittal section. That's kind of what, in the, in the magic brain, that was the, that's the kind of angle that's, uh, that's being shown. But I mean, it would take hundreds of sections to go through the whole thing. And the pattern would be slightly different at each place. And it's really very complex. But I wanted to say something about the hippocampus and mention, again, if you remember, that's one place where there's a lot of neuropeptide receptors meaning virtually every neuropeptide receptor is there. Each is in a slightly different layering pattern. You know, there's people who spend their whole life on one layer of the hippocampus and know exactly what, what the connections are. Well, the hippocampus has to do with memory. That's where, I don't want to say where memory is stored, because uh, I think that might not be quite right. And it, it's totally people really, there's a lot of data on this. There's data based on human beings who've had injuries uh, to that part of their brain. Most of the injuries are induced by surgeons who just sort of knocked it out during an operation. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> and there, there, there's, there, there, there's one very famous patient who's been studied for decades. He's in the Boston area, and every morning he wakes up and doesn't remember anything that happened to him. And every morning he has to be told, hi, did this is, oh, what happened? Where am I? Oh, you had it. You had damage to your brain. You have no, you have no uh, short, you're unable to, you have short, to, you can learn during the day, but you can't remember anything that happened uh, before. He's a famous patient. There's hundreds of papers <laughs> based on this, on, this, on this patient. And you can do it to rats and show that this part of the brain is where memory is stored. So isn't it interesting that it's almost like this memory portal is coded with all of these various um, molecules of emotion receptors. So it's, it's almost like, um, well, there's a phenomenon called uh, dissociated states of learning, and in which scientists have shown that there's different um, states of mind, basically, uh, they can be switched on with different drugs. And when you're working with drugs, you're really just mimicking experimentally what goes on with, in the body. And with different states of mind, um, you learn better. You can recall better what you learned if you're on the same drug that you had at the time you were learning. So an example is if you're a student and you're studying with coffee and cigarettes, you better be smoking coffee and drinking cigarettes or whatever uh, <laughs> when you take the exam or you won't do as well. There's hundreds of papers on rats showing that. So we're all, we all have dissociated states of learning because we all have different chemicals percolating at different times. So each of these states of mind actually have not just different behaviors, different moods, but even different memories that are accessible. And that's probably where the hippocampus comes in. I mean, you know, people, you have different moods. When you're having, uh, you know, a bad day, you guys never have a bad day. <laughs> but when other people <laughs> are having a bad day, I mean, you really can't even remember when it was good. You know, your husband, my husband, he is, ugh. What, I mean, and you just can't remember how great he was only yesterday. You, you literally can't remember because you're, you're, you're filtering things through, you know, you're awash in these chemicals that are, you know, they're not just running your mood, they're actually running your perceptions and your memories. I mean, you, you can't even access those memories. Oh, well, I just want to mention that Valium that's called diazepam. This is the Hoffman-LaRoche receptor. <laughs> this, is, this is actually found in a human brain here. 
And that's a, that's a substance that um, has been studied uh, a lot. And we have our internal anxiety chemical, which is a peptide that binds to this receptor. And the interesting thing about it is they, it does, it's not real ancient. You have to be at least a bony fish, which is an advanced fish, to have a valium receptor. So anxiety is a very advanced concept. Uh, <laughs> love your anxiety. Anxiety means that you have a big enough cortex to hold several options in your brain and to be anxious about which one you're going to choose. <laughs> if you don't have that much cortex, you know, I'll just swim. You know, you just, there's not that many, you know, an amoeba doesn't have to decide whether it should go to college or, or not go to college <laughs> or get a divorce or not. So anxiety is very, very advanced. <laughs> well, I wanted to now tell you about psychoimmunology. And this, this is an editorial that was in Nature magazine, which is a famous uh, science journal. Psychoimmunology before its time. Uh, this was published in about, uh, uh, about 10 years ago, um, I guess more like 13. There's probably a link between the central nervous system and the immune system. That's easily accepted, but the doubt is whether enough is yet known to sustain people's hopes of explanation. And in this article, they said it suggests, I mean, pe dare people to suggest that there's no state of mind that isn't mimicked by a state of the immune system. Well, what touched all this off? The simple discovery that there were endorphins in the immune system. The immune system cells made endorphins. And it took a while for people just to accept the fact, because it really bothered, you know, it really violated. We now know that the immune system makes all kinds of peptides. In fact, it probably makes every peptide that the brain makes. It just, there has to be a scientist who wants to look at that and study it. Um, so then, a great thing happened to me. I divorced my first husband and met Dr. Ruff. Okay. <laughs> Let's get Dr. Ruff in focus here. I really miss him. Somebody do that. All right. He's standing next to the cell that he has spent a lot of time studying, which is called the macrophage. The monocyte is the other name when it's in its um, more babyish form before it's fully developed. And these monocytes are circulating in your blood. And you may have heard of them in the idea that they, they clean up. They're the scavenger cells. They clean up gook. Uh, they, they clean up debris. But that's only a very small aspect of what they do. They actually manufacture the body fabric. And what do I mean by that? If you burn yourself or cut yourself, within seconds, monocytes come rushing to that place and sit there and then orchestrate the whole healing response. They squirt out peptides, and the peptides cause other cells to come crawling over, and they squirt out more peptides, and then the, the, the tissue, the layers of skin there, they respond. And, Everything is done through peptides being squirted out of cells, acting on receptors on other cells, or even sometimes the same cell. And that's, you know, this is, that's immunology. There you go. I mean, I mean, this, it's, that, I mean there's a lot of names. There's a lot of details. It's very exciting. A lot of it has been, is being understood, but that's really what's going on. So what Michael and I were doing in our courtship, among other things, but one of the things we were doing, <laughs> Someone's drawing this out of me. Someone who's in a happy new relationship. I don't know who it is. <laughs> we were showing that, that monocytes have opiate receptors on them, bombesin receptors, valium receptors, all of these receptors for the molecules of emotion, all of these neuropeptide receptors could be found on immune cells, monocytes, and it caused when you sprinkle peptides on these monocytes, it makes them crawl. They follow a gradient, meaning it's like they're smelling something. You know, you're, if you're standing somewhere and you smell fresh bread baking, there's a few, you know, the few molecules come here and you can follow it toward the source. And what you're doing is there's just more and more molecules 
hitting your nose and you can beeline right f through it for it. That would be chemotaxis on some level. But the cells do the same thing. The receptors for the various peptides allow the cell to migrate, to move, to chemotax toward the source of where it's coming. So guess what? Air, all cell trafficking in your body, and your bodies, man, things are moving, you know. Things are moving all over. It is not static. It's not like, there you are forever. I mean, your immune cells are moving all the time. And why are they moving? How are they moving? They're following these chemical trails. They're scenting endorphins, or they're scenting Valium, or they're scenting the other 99 substances. That's how they know to come to the wound site. Sometimes they're running up into the brain. And one of the recent uh, series of discoveries makes us realize that there's much more mingling of the immune system with the brain. There was an old thing that said the immune system is the immune system, and the brain is the brain, and you, you know, separate. But in real life, the immune cells are coursing through the brain, and there's just much more interaction than we had ever thought. Uh, so this is just a summary of a lot of, this is a, a paper that we wrote that summarizes a lot of other papers. Uh, it's kind of the central nervous system and the immune system share a large number of highly conserved, that means it's the same, back to the simplest creatures, specific cell surface recognition molecules, because they recognize, serving as receptors for neuropeptide-mediated intercellular communication. Uh, what I think about this is this was published in the stodgiest, most uh, very respected journal, the Journal of Immunology, in 1985. And the name of the paper was Neuropeptides and Their Receptors, a Psychosomatic Network. And just to get that word psychosomatic in with those immunologists, I had to sit there for three days at the meeting, take all kinds of ribbing. It was like psychosomatic. I mean, there, there's really different scientists go into what they're interested in. So immunologists, they, they like a very simple version of the world generally, and they don't like to uh, think about things about the, like psychosomatic. So anyway, that's dull. But the other thing I think of is this was our softball team. I was the cheerleader. Michael, that's my husband now, not then. He was the catcher. Rick was, Weber was the first baseman, and Miles was the pitcher. And we were all scientists having fun together. Because um, we're people, too, you know. Strange. Now, this is one simple and not such a great slide uh, to illustrate a really important point that actually Miles Herkenham was the first to figure out. With all this mapping going on, this is a real paradigm-breaking discovery. You have in your mind the synapse, and uh, there's a lot of diagrams of how one nerve comes up to another, and there's this little gap, like a moat, the synaptic cleft, and things squirt out, and the neurotransmitter or the neuropeptide moves across just a tiny little gap and hits receptors on the opposite side. That's wrong. Well, it's right for maybe 2% of all the neurons in the brain. But it's turning out that most of them are acting at a distance. And how do we know that? Because here, we develop methods for, here's the receptors being mapped for one peptide called substance P. And substance P is actually a, a pain peptide. It's released from nerves when you have pain. Uh, and this receptor, this is the receptor map, and then right next to it, this is the, where the, where the neuro, the ligand, the substance P is itself. And you can see the substance P is in a totally different place than where the receptors are. This is quite a big distance. This is a rat brain, you know, it's a centimeter or so away. So the brain is much more like a big bag of hormones than you would have thought. So things are moving, swimming, these molecules are uh, just diffusing around, and uh, they're acting at quite a distance. It's not this tightly wired little situation. What keeps it all straight is the receptors. And you should know that an opiate receptor is an opiate receptor. It will bind you know, morphine, et cetera, and the endorphins, but it won't bind Valium. And a Valium receptor is a, it's very, very selective, different, highly specific. So I just want to, I somehow want to mention that this is a, 
the slide I stole, I mean, I borrowed from Michael. <laughs> See, Michael, I get to get all the credit and go out on these things, and he stays home and, you know, I, and does the work. But one of the things that's very interesting is inflammation. What inflammation means is really that white blood cells are moving in to the place to start the healing. And a little inflammation is okay. It's part of healing. But when there's a lot of inflammation, that's when things sort of get out of control. Um, and it's, there's disease processes, which are caused by too much inflammation. But the interesting thing that Michael taught me is that healing can never really start until the inflammation phase is over, which I think is, I think is interesting. I'm not sure. I just I want to put that out there to you. And I want to show you um, something that's interesting. This is, a, this is a, a normal brain of a child. Uh, and this is, these are neurons. It's stained a certain way so that you can see this is like the cell body of a neuron. And then this is called the dendritic tree, or arborization is another name. You know, these are all the dendrites. It's just really very, very complex. Actually, over here is the, a similar place in the brain of a child who died of AIDS. And you can see it's all dearborized. Those connections aren't there uh, anymore. It's literally dried up. But the new research is suggesting that these, these cells in the brain called glial cells, there's 10 times more of them than there are neurons. And those cells have not been appreciated. They've been studied not so much. Only recently they're being studied more. They're kind of the, the cells that squirt out the peptides that keep the nerves alive or kill them or kill parts of them. And it's not like there's your brain and there it is for the rest of your life. It's constantly changing. And what's doing the changes are these glial cells are actually very much like monocytes or macrophages. In fact, they are. There's a lot of cells that start life in your bloodstream as monocytes, and then they go into your brain later on and start to chew up endings. So there's a constant sculpting of, of neurons. And I'm summarizing. This is totally, um, many scientists have, uh, have, are working in this area. You can, I have not worked in this area myself, but you're, you're it's literally eating, sculpting and re-sculpting. It kind of reminds me of, of trauma and inflammation. You know, things can move in. There can be an area that's all infiltrated, but, you know, that part of the brain doesn't know quite which way it's going to go, and maybe it's sort of out of action for a while or hyperstimulated. Then finally it simmers down. These processes are normal, and they're going on, and it's part of uh, how we're thinking and, and, and believing. But I want to make the point that, you know, I don't want to, uh, you know, how people, people react. So I was a neuroscientist, so then I discovered immunology and immunologists and, you know, maybe in partial reaction to the whole first part of my, my life where everybody I knew was a neuroscientist. And I really embrace and get excited about the immune system. And I really want to make the point that we have a communication network here. Now, what's a communication network? The brain, in a way, is overrated um, because there's constant communication going on throughout. I, I actually call it the body-mind without a hyphen because it's just there's so much communication. So the shared common components, they send information. That's the peptides and the other ligands. And they receive information. That's the receptors. And there's a communication among the elements no hierarchical control, no center, no exclusion. I mean, it isn't that the brain is in control. All of, I mean, the brain is kind of part of the immune system. It's in such tight, yes, it's secreting chemicals that are making the immune system change. And the immune system is secreting chemicals that are making the brain change. And a lot of times, for a lot of people, the brain is almost the last to know. Uh, information is coming up from the body. And then the brain makes a story up about it, or um, you know, uh, information is coming in from the outside world, and the brain is, is, is making up a story. Few of us are putting the brain first. It has that capacity. We can gain conscious control. There are techniques to gain conscious control of not, not of the actual processes, but um, 
I'm just very influenced by uh, my dinner conversation, so I haven't quite, that's a little half-baked, let's not put that out there, but it was, there, I had, there was some very stimulating conversation, and I have a lot to learn here. Um, all right, the wisdom of the body, I want to mention that the whole concept of emotions people used to fight about, do emotions originate in the head and trickle down to the body? Cannon, he was from Harvard, turn of the century, he thought so, because he felt that the hypothalamus and the pituitary were squirting out these substances. They actually knew that some of them were peptides then, and they're acting on the body. But William James, these were the James Cannon debates, he had the opposite point of view. He said, no, nope, emotions are an epiphenomenon where we're trying to explain and feel what's going on in the body. James felt that every muscle, every digestive muscle that moved, uh, every little thing that happened in the body, things happened and then chemicals percolated up and that was emotions. Well, which is right. I think now the fact that it's happened, chemically the molecules of emotion are in both places, there's so much intimacy, it's almost a spontaneous uh, kind of effect, and I think, you know, people are talking more about a field theory. You know, we are not, the, you know, we're getting out of this old model. We are, we are a field of intelligence, uh, innate intelligence. That's a term chiropractors have used for, what, a hundred years. Uh, the wisdom of the body, Cannon called it. Uh, there's something about the way it all hangs together. Communication, intelligence, it's not just the molecules. There's some kind of energy field that's, that's, that's set up by it, and I do not pretend to have any answers to this. Um, and I don't think that you know, the people who are going to figure this out are physicists, and they're going to uh, start to measure this. They're not going to be, I'm just a biochemist. My son is a physicist. I have great hopes for him. <laughs> now here's my, di my profound diagram. <laughs> Somehow I was moved to make this diagram one day sort of like an altered state, and for years I couldn't even show it, you know, now it's sort of like a cartoon, but this is the brain, this is the body, this is the necktie right here. <laughs> we're so, this culture, we're, we tend to be very much locked in our heads and not listening, listening to our body, and my definition of the mind is this communication, this field of information, these it's not literally the, the molecules flowing. It's some, uh, something that's set up, some field that's set up from this information flowing, I believe. Just like um, electromagnetic energy is produced whenever uh, a current runs through a wire, you get a field that comes away from it. When all this information is flowing in the body, there's a field that's really beyond the body. And of course, there are healers, therapeutic touch, other people who believe they can see and feel and manipulate that field. As a human being, not as a scientist, as a scientifically minded human being, having been in on this endorphin opiate receptors discovery, I've had the privilege to lecture all over the world to all kinds of interesting groups. And I'm an open minded kind of person. And, you know, my body is my laboratory. And I've experienced some very interesting things that uh, suggest that this field is, is very real and we're just in, just because we can't measure it, well, you know, you can't measure things till you have the right tool. And that's gonna come. You know, you couldn't measure light, you know, with a, with a ruler. So we don't have the right tool yet to measure it. But I wanna mention that the word mind, actually the original root of the word mind is to pay attention. It's, a, it's an Anglo-Saxon word, like minding the store, to pay attention. So a lot of mind is about paying attention. And I want to tell you, I want to share a very important aspect of, of the neuropeptides and the receptors. They, I think, this is, this, is a, this is a theory based on where they are. So we've mapped all of them, you know, many of them. And, and they share another common feature, which is in the parts of the brain that mediate incoming sensory information, sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, the own sensations from your body, the sensations from the outer world, they tend to be loaded 
with the receptors, usually at the first place where they enter the nervous system. Well, what does this mean? I think it has something to do with helping us to decide what to pay attention to. How do we decide? At any given moment, you're sitting there. I mean, I'm giving this talk. I'm not paying that much attention to the fact that my back hurts, but maybe it'll hurt later. And it doesn't hurt. I don't believe that anymore. You know, let me just correct my posture a little bit. All right, it doesn't hurt. Uh, <laughs> there's sounds in the room. It's a hum. Who paid attention to that before? There's a lot coming in, and at any moment, you're making decisions that are usually very subconscious about what to pay attention to. And those decisions are, are based on what? Past experience, some hard wiring, and, and a lot of it's really about survival. And this silly little slide shows, here's a guy, and he is happily eating something here. I don't know what it is. And it's his smell is really activated the gateway of the, of the receptors that, that are allowing smell in. He's going, this smells great. Mm, this tastes great. And then Lee Harvey Oswald comes on a shot. This happened a long time ago. <laughs> and suddenly, this, these, the smell and taste receptors shut down. And now his eyes are going. His eyes are really where the actions is. His eye, that's the information. He's going to start acting on that because this is alarming, and he doesn't even remember or feel the food. Next thing you know, stick him up. Somebody's holding him up. Well, now he doesn't care about what he sees or what he smells or what he tastes. Now he's going to wheel around, and obviously he's going to pay attention to that. A lot of what we pay attention to is really old stuff, uh, old patterns, old evolutionary patterns, where there's a threat or a perceived threat and, but it's a, it's a challenge to consciously work on making conscious decisions about what to pay attention to. I feel ridiculous talking to you. You know a thousand times more about this than I do. But I think it's interesting that the molecules of emotion, what we perceive at any moment, is being filtered through our own, own emotions. And this is where, you know, what is this reality, this so-called reality up, out there? It's just not the same for any two people. We're, we're constantly creating a reality based upon our emotional experience. And I should mention a very important fact. The fact that I don't have a good slide to illustrate it doesn't mean it's not a really important fact. Hundreds of neuroscientists have proven that learning and memory occurs wherever there's a receptor. Uh, there's a whole bunch of studies showing that when the receptor receives a drug or when, when a pathway is activated, meaning a group of neurons fire in a circle, it's more likely to fire the next time. And that has to do with the receptors on its surface. So the receptors are changing all the time. It's not like you're born with 152 trillion opiate receptors and that's it, depending on whether you're taking opiates, how much pleasure you're having or not having, the, the receptors are changing all the time. And that, those are the places where learning occurs. So uh, there's a lot of learning. We learn what to see. We learn what to look at. We learn what to feel. We can unlearn it and consciously um, uh, uh, control it. And there's a good example in the book of something that I'm starting to think about the, the emphasis on the midbrain that Ramtha has talked about is very interesting to me. The, the, you know, I've always been really hung up on and excited by the frontal cortex because chimpanzees don't have a frontal cortex as big as ours. They have 99% of the same DNA that we do, but um, you know, they have this. You know, we have this big brain. You know, a monkey, a chimp. They're not monkeys. They're primates. They have a little slope back here. They don't have much up front. Stuff that's behind our forehead is really unique to humans. And the midbrain is kind of, um, it hasn't interested me that much. However, there are a lot of automatic emotional things that are mediated by, by the, by the midbrain. So what your eyeballs look at at any given moment, they're darting back and forth. There are muscles that do that. You're not consciously aware of that. 
uh, and and that uh, the 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 where that's controlled feeds into the midbrain, and there's a lot of emotional receptors on it. So it's not how you even react. What you even see is mediated through your emotions. And the example is the cuckolded husband who everyone in the town knows what's going on, but somehow he never sees the evidence of what's going on. He walks right over the man's underpants that are lying there on the floor. He, he didn't see them. And if you could have analyzed it, you would have seen his eye and there's studies to support that. It may have scanned, and it just when it saw it, it, it looked away. And, and so that's going on. Our emotions are affecting what we perceive, not just what we believe, but what we even experience. Okay, boy, I'm really going on and on. Uh, but I heard you guys can sit up for hours. <laughs> 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 I just want to make the point, another aspect of emotions is they integrate us into one full body mind. So this is a, a kidney that has angiotensin receptors. Angiotensin is a hormone, a peptide, and it's the thirst peptide. If you put it into the brain of a rat, the rat will furiously drink water, whether it's really thirsty or not. It will create thirst. If you dribble the angiotensin peptide on the receptors of the kidney, it will, the kidney will make concentrated urine. It will work to conserve water. If you put it on the angiotensin receptors of the lung cells, the lung will exhale less water vapor. So you could say that angiotensin has an overall effect of, sob, of creating thirst and conserving water. That's a really good, clear example. We, we don't have examples that clear for other, other peptides, but the idea is it's, happening all over the body and you know it, it is one organism and it has to be kind of integrated it has to be act as a whole and that's kind of what emotions do so if you're emotionally i don't know i want to do this i want to do that and you're lying to yourself and you're contorted you can really see that um, you're not going to be very effective and you might even get sick because you know the communication things are shut down parts of the body aren't communicating well. So you're kind of looking for really good overall uh, communication without parts that are out of the loop. That's nice. I don't know what that means. <laughs> it's from Omni. <laughs> this is Georgetown where I am. I am a professor now in Washington, D.C. after years at the NIH. Isn't that pretty? And I I think, let's see, it's quarter to, no, to nine. I want to leave, I really want to have some questions because I know that that would help. And I think I want to uh, end it here. I, does anyone have a, an opinion? JC, do you have an opinion? Yeah. Oh, you're so sweet. But we want. <laughs> How am I holding up? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm going for this drug here that's going to really get me going, this, this Coca-Cola. <laughs> you couldn't get that through the FDA if you tried today. Between the, yeah. Oh. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. OK. OK, well, I'll say a couple of things uh, right now, and then we'll take a break and have a few questions. And um, everybody close your eyes. I don't want you to see, I want to check what's on the next slide, and I don't want you to see it, okay? <laughs> Nobody cheat. Come on, close your eyes right now. Uh -huh. Okay, yes, all right. Okay, well, let me just tell you a little bit about viruses. Yes, sorry. <laughs> good, good, very good. Let me tell you about viruses. It, it is a scientific fact that virtually all viruses use receptors to enter and infect a cell. If a virus, uh, they don't just randomly glom on. People used to think they just randomly glom on. 
they fit into specific receptors. So the measles virus uses the, actually the substance P receptor. You know, in measles you get red, inflamed uh, places. That's because it's actually mimicking the action of substance P, which also does that. So each virus has its own receptor or set of receptors that it uses. And this is important, not just for developing drug therapies for diseases against viruses. And let me tell you that you're going to see, this is a real, this is a prediction based upon what I know that's going on at the NIH and in labs. It's just sort of starting. Viruses cause a lot of diseases. In fact, it's a, the, the, the retroviruses, which, of which AIDS is a class, you're going to see that they cause one type of multiple sclerosis. You're going to see that. You're going to see the role that uh, they're played in, in schizophrenia. Uh, viruses cause a lot of diseases. So it's, it's corny, but the silver cloud in the AIDS epidemic is the knowledge that's going to come from this is going to be used to cure all sorts of, of diseases. That's going to be a legacy of, uh, of what happened in AIDS. Um, so I wanted to mention that, but I also want to mention to you that there's, there's an explanation. There's a psychosomatic aspect even to viruses. So you could say, well, what do you mean? How could that be? A virus is a virus. It makes you sick. No. Uh, I was reminded at dinner about something Louis Pasteur was said to have said on his deathbed. You know, he invented germ theory. He invented germs. And he said, le milieu est tout. The environment is everything. It's not the germ, it's the ground on which the germ falls. It's not the seed, it's, it's the earth where, where it is. So our bodies, oh, I know you're missing, no, it's okay. Our bodies, uh, at any given moment, depending what ligands, what our internal juices are occupying various receptors, will affect whether the virus is able to get in there or not. So it's really amazing uh, in terms of of what can happen. And I met a woman last night um, in Berkeley who told me this astounding story. I'm sure there's much more astounding stories, but I thought this was interesting. She was deathly ill with what she thought was the flu. She had 104 fever. Her boyfriend was mopping her brow. They were thinking of going to the hospital. And someone hit her answering machine, and it announced that she had won a free trip to Australia. She jumped up, she screamed, she got excited there, ah, ah, and then it was 10 minutes before she realized she was fine. <laughs> and, <laughs> her fever was gone. And, you know, it turns out, this is a total fact, everybody would agree with it, that the cold viruses that cause that actually use the same receptor that the neurotransmitter norepinephrine uses. And there's a whole literature suggesting that neuro, norepinephrine has to do with exhilaration and excitement. So you get that rush of norepinephrine, which is related to adrenaline. And now all those receptors are filled with norepinephrine molecules. And they're, they're blocking it. And now the virus can't get in. And the virus recedes, and the immune system wins. So, so. So don't tell me, I, don't tell me you're feeling lousy. It's, it's terrible to be my kid. Uh, he complains I never let him stay home from school. Get up! I don't want to hear you have a cold. Get in there. Right. Okay. We're going to thank you uh, very much for your attention. I think we're going to have questions for the second half, and I really uh, have enjoyed talking to you so far. Thank you. Okay, we were discussing, we have to uh, show Dr. Pert a percentage thing. So would you all sit down, please? This is gonna be a up and down moment, okay? <laughs> Out of all of you here tonight, how many of you have ever found your card since you've been in school, stand up? <laughs> Okay, thank you. Now sit down. Wait, I want to do, okay, 
wait a minute. How many have had miraculous healings? Stand up. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Now, um, I know some of you are here tonight just for Dr. Pert, uh, and some of you are here for the whole retreat. However, some of you were here just today, uh, so you're the ones that were out in the field. So those of you that were only here today, during the day, uh, doing field work, would you please stand up? Now, those of you that found your card today, raise your hand. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> we were trying to explain percentages out of how many of you were here and what's the percentage of people that found their card and you know how that fluctuates on a given day. <laughs> so I think at this time, unless, uh, Jay-Z, was there anything else? Was there anything else, Jay-Z, that you wanted to? That's enough. Okay. <laughs> In which case, it is my honor to reintroduce Dr. Candace Pert. This is the question period, but I wanted to, uh, JC and we were having a conversation about um, drugs and uh, what's going on with drugs, and JC was sharing some of Ramtha's teachings, which really go along with the ideas that I've evolved based on the science. Uh, there are, it is a scientific fact proved numerous times over that any drug that you take, any exogenous ligand, well, what happens to the receptor when you take the ex uh, exogenous ligand? And what, take, what happens to the internal ligand? The answer is, essentially without exception, in every case, the receptors shrink up. They're being bombarded by the external drug. The organism, wanting to have homeostasis, wanting to keep everything right, uh, the receptors literally disappear, or they become less sensitive. Also, the internal substance uh, decreases, the ability to, to make it diminishes. So if you're a heroin addict, you have, if not lost the ability to make endorphins, you make, you make way less of it. That, so, that's, so that's going on all the time. So drugs, you know, and I'm saying an exogenous ligand, internal, you might get the idea that they're the same, but let's take a moment to think about uh, what's actually going on. Uh, the internal pharmacy that we have is really perfect. It's at any moment there might be, let's take peptide B, whatever, a certain peptide, there might be a lot flowing in one part of your brain, but none flowing in your spleen and a little bit coming out of your pancreas. If I didn't mention it before, your digestive system is loaded with these neuropeptides and your digestive system all along the entire tube is uh, so many nerves. It's like a, a mini brain. There's more nerves in your entire intestine probably than there is in your brain running the whole thing with the, with the with the neuropeptides, and we joke about gut feelings. And um, so, you know, we're very complex and perfect, and the right amount of each particular juice is getting to the right place, or at least has the potential to do that. When you take an external drug, it goes in, it's not, uh, it's pretty primitive, it's not elegant at all. It just flooded, every receptor that's in your body is flooded everywhere. That ain't the same thing as a little here, the subtlety of what your body naturally does. The other important fact is that these peptides are all very easily degraded, gotten rid of. 
when they do their job. So they get squirted out and every single cell has enzymes that basically destroy the peptides, inactivate them at, at, a, at, at a pace. Whereas the drugs that you take, they can only be inactivated in one organ in your body. Do you know what that organ is? Your liver. So your liver's, you know, working pretty hard. It's already got loads from all the poly, uh, the, the partially hydrogenated fats and the herbicides and the pesticides. Um, and then it's a load. It's like amazing. You know, little babies don't even have those liver enzymes that detox drugs until they're several months old. And yet a lot of babies are born with so many drugs circulating, not because their mother was a cocaine addict, but because the mother didn't want to have, quote, pain for, you know, a couple of hours. So the drugs are in the baby and it's in there for a while. Old people, their livers aren't doing that well necessarily. And, uh, you know, they're loaded with all kinds of drugs. I think a lot of the, there's a lot of iatrogenic illness where people are just getting too many, uh, too many drugs and people aren't thinking of this. So it's very different. The external drugs are flooding, it takes a long time for them to be inactivated. Our own internal juices are very subtle, they're inactivated wherever they go. So it's just uh, external drugs we take uh, change our ability to, to respond. And of course there's a whole literature in psychopharmacology, LSD, different, different drugs that affect the brain, and they all do, this is one of the corollaries just because a physician is saying, take this for your high blood pressure or your cholesterol level, I think virtually all of these receptors are both in the brain and in the body. So they're affecting both, even though people aren't really uh, studying it that way. So you take these, the drugs uh, literally change the firing of the neurons. Some neurons overfire and die. Uh, marijuana is, uh, there's, there's really a lot of scientific study on, uh, you know, memory loss, actual loss of neurons that goes on. And then you go like, well, what about our own internal marijuana? I mean, why would we have that? That seems bad. Well, it's not the same thing. It's a subtle chemical that it's just in the right place, just when you need it. Maybe you need to get rid of, you know, a pattern or, 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 or whatever. It's just a very, very different, uh, different thing. So I hope that's, that's helpful to your thinking. Now, and I'm really looking forward to the question and comment and sharing period. And I'm, and, um, I, I'm gonna, I'll field my own questions a little bit and we'll see, we'll see how that goes. And I just, questions, comments to help. And I'm really excited to hear anything people have to say. This lady in the front, no. They have to go to the back with it. That makes sense. Please. Candace, um, I don't know if Diane or Jay-Z has told you, but um, our remarkable teacher, Rampa, just several weeks ago spent uh, 11 hours on stage that you're sitting at uh, talking about this incredible arena that you've been in for the last 25 years. He did that without notes. And uh, at least for me, enabled me to go to your book, uh, two days later and read it in three sittings and feel familiar with the content. So wow. thank you very much for the marvelous book and um, my ability to understand it, of course, has a lot to do with our teacher. My question is as follows. At the end of your book, you mentioned peptide T. Yeah. And um, I kind of felt I was left hanging as to know what the most recent experience you've had with it. And along with that, and the fact that we're talking about AIDS here, have you heard of the Robert Beck machine that um, actually has a frequency uh, of AIDS that has been discovered? I haven't heard about the Robert Beck machine, but the update on peptide T, you're left hanging. I'm always left hanging. <laughs> I've been left hanging now. It's been 11 years. but. Um, there, there are some really very positive developments. One is that there is a clinical trial for uh, a disease which is called PML. It's a progressive uh, fatal end stage of AIDS disease. And even though you're hearing about the triple drug combination, and yes, it's been a great advance, but people are still actually dying with, uh, uh, even though there's undetectable virus. So there's clinical trials now 
that are just being started. There's uh, preliminary data that suggests that peptide T really is a tremendous help in this disease. Not that it doesn't do other aspects of AIDS, but this is something that's really easy to document because people who uh, definitely have this diagnosis, 80% of them die within three months. So that's really sort of easy to study. It's gruesome, but it's easy to study. So there's going to be, uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that um, by October, there'll be the solid data that will prove that it works for this disease. And this, will, this is a study through the FDA, and then it will be available when it's available for one use, it's available for any other AIDS uses. And then on a more modest front, wasting, AIDS wasting. This goes on. People lose weight. Uh, and at Georgetown, I think we've discovered the actual mechanism of how this occurs. And we have a paper that's coming out in the proceedings of the National Academy of Science, which is a very prestigious organization. You know it's prestigious because only 2% of the members are women. That's how. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, it obeys, I call it Pert's Law. <laughs> the prestige of an organization is inversely proportional to the percentage of women in it. <laughs> but that being said, I'm really happy that, it, that it's in there. What, what we found, and I need to say one important fact that uh, there's many papers now supporting this idea. The virus, uh, I told you that the AIDS virus uses receptors to enter and infect cells. Well, it has what's called an envelope protein. If you remember that picture, what the AIDS virus really looks like, and it spikes like Darth Vader, each one of those spikes is one protein molecule, and each virus has hundreds, several hundred of them. But what happens is it's imperfect. When the virus um, is being made, for each perfect little virion that gets made, there are literally hundreds, if not thousands, of these envelope proteins that get sort of spit out. So they're circulating like another hormone, and they're binding and, and, and kind of screwing up receptors for which uh, the AIDS virus normally uses. And those receptors are called chemokine receptors. This has been newly discovered, uh, these chemokine receptors. It's another, it's another peptide. So I'm rambling on uh, the wasting we now think that there's another peptide in the body we know called growth hormone releasing hormone. You've all heard of growth hormone. It's a peptide. Uh, the growth hormone releasing hormone releases that from your pituitary gland. And um, it turns out that when uh, you're wasting, uh, children need growth hormone to grow. Adults need growth hormone to not waste, to stay in positive protein balance. So AIDS, people with AIDS often do not have enough growth hormone, and we think we've figured out, we've proven that this viral envelope protein all by itself in rats, in the, on the pituitary gland and in the brain, uh, blocks the growth hormone receptor. It actually competes with it. There's a part, there's a peptide sequence identical in the AIDS virus envelope protein and in the... Um, growth hormone uh, sequence, and in peptide T. And they all compete. And peptide T perfectly corrects it, both in the rat and, and in the pituitary. I think I should show one slide. Are the slides dismantled? Or just, there is, I think it's the next, I'll whip through a, a couple. Just mix, a picture can be worth a thousand words on this. So it's great. I'm really. It's great, so we've cured AIDS in rats. Wow, so what about, uh, when do we get to, when does this go into people? Well, there are clinical trials planned. Well, that, I gotta show that one, I'm sorry. This is from my archives. This is Michael and me after we climbed this uh, Haleakala in Maui. And I talk about it in the book, and Michael doesn't like me to talk about how we saw a rainbow and climbed this mountain and climbed this crater and how we had the idea for peptide T. And I really felt like there was a divine inspiration. He said, don't do it. It's like too weird. You'll turn everybody <laughs> off. Here I feel like it's all right, right? <laughs> yeah. But this is, um, 
we thought the hike, we went up the back side of Maui instead of the front. This, of course, was 11 years ago. But um, we, he told me that the hike was four miles and 4,000 feet, and he was, he was only off by a factor of two. It was actually eight miles and 8,000 feet, <laughs> which we did in one day. And then when we came down from the mountain three days later, I went to the first uh, symposium on AIDS, on neuro-AIDS that was being held uh, in Maui at an important meeting. And as I was giving my talk, and all I had at the time for the talk was the fact that the receptors that the virus used, at that time they only knew one receptor called T4. Uh, we had shown that it was in brain as well as being in the immune system. And I was just showing the receptor maps. And in fact, I'll show you the actual slide that I was showing. This is the actual slide. And this slide was up on the wall in Maui. And I had sat through, I was the last speaker, and I heard all these unbelievable stories of the suffering of the patients. You know, it wasn't just an immune disease, it was a, a mind disease, and their minds were being destroyed. And I sat there, I had tears in my eyes, and whatever happened from climbing the volcano, the, whether it was the exhaustion or what, as I was showing this slide, I said, these are the receptors for the virus, and if we could find the natural internal peptide that normally uses this receptor, we could make it as a drug, and it would block, clog up these receptor sites. You can see this is the hippocampus, by the way, where there's a lot of it. It would clog up the receptor sites, and then the virus wouldn't be able to get in. And as I said this, I heard a voice very distinctly, and it said, you should do that. <laughs> I heard it. <laughs> <laughs> and the worst thing about it, feminist that I was, it was clearly a man's voice. <laughs> and um, it, it was that, and the next day, I mean, it was, I felt sort of crazy because it was such a billion to one long shot, but I started kind of calling the mainland and organizing the lab and thinking, how could we figure out, how could we do that? The normal way you do it is you actually do chemistry. You isolate it. You grind up the brains, and you purify, and you find it. And that could take two years more. So we had the idea to use the computer to look at the sequence. You can see that all sequences of all the peptides and proteins known are now in the database. So we had the idea to use a computer-assisted database search. And what the idea to look for, it's simple, look for the piece of this viral envelope protein that is in common with some other peptide or substance that's been discovered. And it wasn't simple. Out came reams of data. It was very confusing. And somehow, Michael and I poured over these for three weeks. And at the end, we said, this is it. Let's try this. And we only had made Basically, there's one peptide. You know, drug companies make hundreds hoping to, to, to get it. We made one. Uh, it may or may not be relevant that Michael and I had just decided to get married right before we left on this trip. <laughs> I believe it is somehow. Um, but that sequence, uh, that was it. The very first one we made, and since then we've made hundreds, and none of them has been as good as the one that we made, and I kind of uh, tell, uh, tell the story in it, and this is the drug that's, that's today in, in clinical trials. So it was found rationally, but when that first experiment worked, you know, there was just this belief that you had to, you had to keep going, and there's been, um, you know, it's been, I, I tell the story, it's been a little bit hard, but I'm feeling that we're coming to the end, at least in terms of AIDS, in terms of proving that it will be helpful to people. So that, that's, that's, an, that's the peptide T story. But I wanted to show you this so you could visualize a little better. So here's the virus. And it's got, it's, each one of these has several hundred amino acids strung together. And it really is like this. And this is a key thing. Sometimes you can have a large peptide or a large protein, but the part that actually fits in the receptor is very small. It might only be five amino acids long or eight amino acids long. 
it's almost like the whole rest of it only exists to hold that little part in just the right, right position. Uh, that is the truth. And it's amazing how many people don't realize this. This has tremendous application in biotechnology because new important proteins are being discovered every day. Virtually everyone has a receptor and all you have to do is find the right piece and have assays for receptors. So here's a loose GP120 molecule and we measure those in people and other people have measured them now. Uh, people have a lot of these, even in the earliest stages, they have a lot of this floating around. So today you have people who have no virus detectable. They're taking the triple drug combination, but they're, they're failing, they're wasting, they're getting neuroaids, they're dying. They're dying and there's no virus in their blood. Sometimes the virus is going up and down, but sometimes there's no, now does this mean the virus doesn't cause the disease? No, I don't think so. It simply means that um, it's not that the virus doesn't cause the disease, it's, hmm, I lost the thought. What's the beginning of the sentence? Pardon? Yeah, it's not caused by the virus, but it is caused by the virus. It's caused by this sort of part of the virus that, that, that breaks off. So it's binding to the receptor. Now, why is that receptor there? Originally, we talked about VIP. That was the first natural internal substance that, whose receptor the virus was using. It's called VIP. It stands for vasoactive intestinal peptide. And here, it's only about 28 amino acids long. See, there it is like a bead. But the part, the peptide T part, is, is only, it's only an octopeptide. Peptide T is only eight amino acids long. Now here's an interesting question. Why there is data and has been some data, it's kind of soft, not, you know, the mainstreamers who don't believe that the mind has anything to do with anything, uh, kind of ignore it, but there is a feeling that there's some people with AIDS who do very well. They have the virus and they can go on. They're, They've had it for 15 years, and they just do very well. Uh, and, and what's going on? Well, maybe the clue lies with vasoactive intestinal peptide, which of all the peptides we ever looked at, it's the only one that is really rich in the frontal cortex. And as you go further back in the brain, there's less and less of it. Um, it's in the thymus gland, it's in the intestines, it's actually in, in the genitalia of both men and women. It's interesting, it's all along the spinal cord, uh, and it's, it's, it's actually in some of these classic chakra regions. That blew my mind when I, when I first heard about it. So I'm making a wild theory to explain that the people who do well, they have one thing in common, they're very into serving other people, they have a lot of self-love and self-respect. A lot of people who have AIDS have very low opinions of themselves. They're very, uh, you know, feel bad, feel guilty. And, and some of them just have risen to the occasion. And it's a self-love, a self-respect thing. So I'm fantasizing that people who might have a lot of VIP naturally, for whatever reason, have a lot of self-love and self-respect, might have a, natural, a naturally slow progression of the disease. But, you know, that's a small percentage. It would be nice to have drugs. <laughs> so we can, we can turn that off. That's the peptide T question, but it goes on. I mean, there are other uses of the drug. It is the most amazing thing because um, these chemokines, which are additional receptors, and that also uses the growth hormone, releasing hormone, many of these things were discovered years after peptide T was discovered, and yet the sequence it turns out it fits these receptors, which is really astounding. So, um, you know, we have like this big, it's like trying to land Moby Dick in a rowboat. <laughs> I mean, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger, and we're just uh, hanging on for the ride. And um, I've gotten really clear, a lot of what the book's about is my personal transformation. Um, you guys really understand it, and I know there's a lot I can learn here, but I have this real sense uh, I've had it for some time that for it to really manifest the way it needs to, it, it's something inside of myself that has to uh, be corrected or fixed or realizing that it's perfect or whatever, whatever that is. And I know that. I've known that for some time. 
And I'm going to learn about how to do that, right? Tomorrow? <laughs> Hi. My question goes back to your early uh, paper, your first paper, talking about the opium receptor sites. Uh, some of the literature that I've read over the years that talks about those people who are, quote unquote, by science, an alcoholic or a drug addict who is based on uh, their receptor sites, their dopamine receptor sites are tied up with THIQ. And if they cease to drink, that supposedly builds on again at that same area. Um, they start at the same point of degradation. If they start drinking again, like when they're uh, 30 years away from it, they begin the same physical degradation. My question to you, and you started to work on that, and, and I, I understand where you're talking about the receptor sites shrink, but has there been any... Re are you going to get into, or has there been any research that talks about how, you talk about how the receptor site has the ligand bind into it. Has there been any consideration for those who are cocaine addicts and heroin addicts and opium people and, and things like that, how to unbind those receptor sites to take that loose, to set that area back to freedom? Well, uh, the the... The way you set the area back to freedom is don't put the drugs into the body anymore. Uh, because the, they don't, let me make something clear, when drugs bind, or even internal ligand, they don't sit there for the rest of their lives. They're, they're actually ping-ponging on and off. They're binding and unbinding. And depending on how tightly they bind, and there's a whole mathematics of it, it's how long they stay. So one, here, one molecule might be staying for a few seconds and then coming off. And another one might be staying for a few minutes and coming off. Another one might be going like that. So they're always coming off and then the stuff that's off gradually gets cleared away by your liver. So the trick is just not to put them in your body anymore and then everything will correct itself. The trick, piece of cake, right? <laughs> Dr. Pert, thank you for both your contributions to date and also for being here. Um, I have a question which uh, I'll, I'll sort of preface with uh, a little background. Uh, in the early part of your book, you, you mention, uh, I don't know whether it was artistic license or whether you had something more in mind, but you mentioned that the peptides and receptor sites have a a music, a, a resonance about them. Um, as a bioengineer and, and a radiation physicist, I've, I have a certain twist on it myself as to what might be happening, but I wanted to ask you if you envision, or perhaps you've already thought of, uh, a more subtle means of explaining, for example, why there are certain very specific uh, pathways, for example, for uh, cancer metastasis that, that have nothing to do with uh, vascularization and, and, uh, and circulation, but yet are very, very specific for certain types of cancers. Uh, my thought is that the, it may be because there is a, a resonance to these very you know, different parts of the body. I'm wondering if you, in your work about receptors and receptor sites, you had looked at, at that aspect of it, of the, the resonance, as opposed to a purely uh, chemical or biochemical approach. Since I'm just a biochemist, I haven't. Uh, I haven't looked at it. I don't have the techniques to look at it, but I think what you're suggesting is very sound, and I don't think it's a metaphor. We know they vibrate. We know there's this idea called resonance. We know that if we pluck a violin string, the other violin in the room uh, will vibrate. There's a, there's a, a subtle energy or, a, or a, a aspect to all this that I am not an expert on. In the book, I speculate a little here and there, very primitive. Uh, I've gotten a lot of really interesting comments from engineers and physicists who, who are expanding uh, the thinking of it. We didn't talk too much about cancer, just a few 
cancer facts. One cancer fact is many cancers secrete peptides. Sometimes they secrete, they, small cell carcinoma of the lung makes not just bombesin, I talk about that discovery, but it, they make endorphins. Different, pep, different tumors make different kinds of peptides, which is very interesting that the tumors are kind of in communication with the rest of the body, and the tumors have receptors on their surface. So it's the, you know, you can create the kind of tumor that you need to supply you with the peptide <laughs> that you're lacking. That's one kind of a strange view. Uh, but, but, but there is a, a scientific fact that these peptides are being secreted uh, by, by the tumors. Uh, other facts are that um, we all have little cancer cells that arise every single day of our lives, and we have our natural line of defense. They're called natural killer cells. They're kind of modified monocytes, as I talked about. They have peptide receptors. They have emotion molecule receptors on their surface. Um, and yet somehow, um, uh, you know, what happens? Why do some people get cancer and others don't? And the answer is, um, who knows? Uh, but <laughs> somehow the natural killer cells aren't doing, doing their job. So, the current in conventional medicine with the, the, the chemo, it, it kills all rapidly dividing cells in the body, which means it kills immune cells. It kills the very cells that are, that are supposed to be fighting it. So it's really, it's a, it's a tragic flaw. Uh, the drugs we have are not very good. I think there's only two forms of cancer that can truly be cured by chemo. Uh, most of them, it's amazing how little <coughs> science is behind uh, what passes for, uh, you know, cancer therapy in this country. It's amazing how bad the science and how little science is really there. And, 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 and the double standard for uh, complementary medicine, it's, it's a really amazing thing. I mean, there is really hard data about emotional expression, art, using art therapy, using visualization therapy in cancer with unbelievable good results. I mean, nothing like, you know, nobody's doing what you guys are doing, but you know, you have to be kind. People are trying, they're moving along. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, uh, there's, there's hard data and there's more and more hard data. There's a, I was at UCSF uh, the other day and there's a, a, an army funded trial to look at breast cancer and to see what happens when you add um, art therapy and visualization, etc. So this is funded by the army. So the culture is getting ripe for it, but there's going to be a big battle. Watch to see how all this is going to develop. You know, it's a, it's a billion dollar, a multi-billion dollar industry, the cancer industry, and I'm really very, very critical of it. Um, you know, just just one point that's important is that. Um, you, once a drug, this is the system, once a drug has been shown to be efficacious, even if it's a tiny little effect, that's called standard of care. And that means ethically after, every time a scientific study is run, you must compare it to the drug that worked. That means what? There's no placebo group anymore. So when you're reading in the newspapers, a new combination, it's, you, you live longer. Well, statistically, you live three months longer. But there's no group in there that doesn't have the drug. A critical scientist would say, maybe the group that doesn't have any of the drugs would live longer than all of them. <laughs> but it's not in there. So, you know, when we talk about drugs are bad, I myself come to be very anti-drug. And I'm not just talking about cocaine and heroin and marijuana. You know, I'm talking about, you know, chemo and uh, you know, aspirin and, you know, within reason, you know, once in a while. But, um, you know, all of the, there's nothing as perfect as what we have within us, potentially, if you can figure out how to use it. And um, that's... <laughs> now, don't show this tape to any um, <laughs> pharmaceutical people. <laughs> I don't want to end up like Karen Silkwood here, you know. <laughs>